My name is Ahmed Amoudi. I'm the Senior Administration Manager for Microfund for Women from Jordan. I have a passion for work in, uh, in, in companies that have uh, a social uh, mission. Uh, Microfront for Women is a not-for-profit organization and basically our primary mission is, is to help uh, lower income people. And that's the main thing that attracted me to work for Microfund and then uh, it's a place where I can actually apply my uh, experience in insurance and uh, financial planning. We are a microfinance institution in Jordan. We've been uh, established since 1996. Um, the reason that I'm here today is because we have launched a microinsurance product recently and uh, we wanted to share our experience for the past two years. We piloted the product for one year and uh, afterwards we rolled it out um, throughout the uh, region and uh, the area in Jordan. Um, it's been a very successful product. Uh, it's a product that covers hospital stays. So basically it's called caregiver hospital cash. If a client stays in the hospital, uh, we pay uh, an amount equal to uh, 14 US dollars for every night spent in the hospital and uh, the premium for that would be a 1.4 US dollar for every month. Uh, this product is offered to our clients uh, for the duration of their loan term and at, at the end of the term, then they can elect to renew it with a new loan. There's been a lot of research that was done uh, and, and able to determine the capacity of the client to, uh, uh, for what amount they can afford to pay monthly and for what coverage they would like to be covered. Um, actually, that was one of the challenges in order to formulate the product and uh, make a prototype. Um, again, it was uh, research. Uh, the product was uh, rolled out and the feedback was uh, superior. And that's why we're here to share our experience today. Our first um, insurance product was introduced in 2006 and it is um, the credit life insurance. And uh, MFW has the credit life insurance in an untraditional way where it's basically a term insurance for the duration of the loan. Um, afterwards, uh, based on the uh, client's research and the feedback we got, um, we determined that there's a gap, there's a need for um, additional type of insurance that would cover our clients from um, unexpected risks and basically we started working with the uh, WWB, our network, and also we applied for a grant from the ILO and used a lot of uh, uh, external experience in order to uh, formulate the product and pilot it. Knowing the uh, microinsurance uh, clients, uh, basically they're the lower income um, lower level of education. So some of these challenges would be to educate the clients on whatever product that you plan to launch and, and serve their needs with that product. Um, one of the challenges that we faced while rolling out um, this microinsurance product caregiver was to teach the clients about insurance, what insurance is and uh, how it could be used and how it could be uh, covering them from uh, unforeseen risks. Of course, I mean, uh, it's very difficult to try and to teach someone about insurance when they're worried about earning their living for the day. We started with making the product mandatory. So every, every loan that's uh, dispersed, that product goes out with it. Um, as soon as uh, clients started filing claims, the word of mouth came out. So um, of course, initially the clients trusted us. Some of these clients have been with Microfund for Women over 10, 12 years. Uh, so they trust that Microfund is offering them a product for their own benefit. And um, as soon as they seen the claims getting paid, the word of mouth came out and actually that helped the product to even uh, uh, become more popular. I'm David Drawer. I am a practitioner of health insurance for over 30 years, and I am the founding chairman of the Micro Insurance Academy, which operates in India and in a few other countries in different capacities. We have a team of 65 full-time professionals in India now. We have about 10 other professionals in <coughs> other countries. and. 
In previous phases, I have been uh, honorary professor of health insurance at Erasmus University, Rotterdam. I have worked for many years with the social protection sector of the ILO. And I have been a practitioner before and after the ILO, and even during my d days in the UN, in health insurance. I did field research before the Academy was founded in South Africa, in the Philippines, in Kyrgyzstan, in India. And after we collected the data and we analyzed the situation and we had what we needed to calculate premiums, we went back to communities and offered them the explanation how to create a health insurance that they would govern, that they would own, that they would finance and that they would benefit from, a mutual. And quite a number of communities said after a dialogue, okay, we understand this idea, we actually like it, but where do we get help? So I had nowhere to send them to get help, so I created the Microinsurance Academy to provide this technical assistance in microinsurance domain knowledge, in insurance domain knowledge. Insurance is not an intuitive thing. It's very technical, but it also needs to be done locally and relevant in a relevant manner. This is where the Microinsurance Academy was born. I think that one of the biggest issues that is unresolved and to a great extent unaddressed is the issue of small is beautiful and big is beautiful. There is merit to doing certain things at the micro level at the grassroots level, at community-based level. There is merit to doing other pieces of the paradigm at a global level, at a country level or international level. These two levels do not dialogue with each other. There is no institutional framework to do that, and there are very many um, elements in the institutional environment which are hostile to this dialogue. For instance, community-based schemes, when they cover risk, when they underwrite risk, they are not allowed in many countries by law to seek reinsurance. So how can you manage risk and grow with it if without reinsurance? There is no insurance education on a large scale. How can you expect people to understand and want insurance if this is not part of the education they get? So there are very many issues like that. Small is beautiful, big is beautiful, but the interface and the layering is the first point. If we want people to understand insurance, if we want people to participate, if we want people to pay, we have to invest so that people understand it. Today, insurance education is only given to the industry adjudicators, agents, claims processors, but the people who have to pay are not educated. They have many reasons not to trust a process they don't understand. And if they don't trust, they don't pay. And if they don't pay, we're back to square one. The third issue is what will drive this move, in my view, is insurance, not health. Insurance can drive health insurance. Health cannot drive health insurance. Health does not understand the paradigm, the structure of how to finance health, access to health, health services. Everybody should do what they're best at. If you have a cardiac problem, you don't go to the dentist. Why? Because you assume that the dentist knows dentistry, but not cardiology. Why would we go to the health group for health insurance? They don't know insurance. So we need to be coherent about it, and therefore insurance will drive this process. The next point is, we're talking here about systems, systems of insurance. Those systems have to be predictable. They have to be good for their money and they have to be good for their word. Both things today do not exist. There are two kinds of components of this predictability. There is trust in people, individual trust, and there is trust in institutions. If you look at countries that work and countries that don't, it is very much around the question of institutional predictability and institutional reliability. 
if we do nothing about it, even if we pour in all the money in the world, we're not going to get where we want to be. We have talked a lot during this conference about the fact that there is no one-size-fits-all solution, that customization is necessary, that there are different issues, both cultural, financial, circumstantial, that must be brought into the paradigm. However, we know that to do that requires some systemic thinking. We can't reinvent the wheel in each village, not possible. So we need to develop mass customization. It's not enough to say we need to customize. Now we need to go beyond that and develop mass customization. This means developing a prototype for a new health system, different from managed competition, which is failing in developing countries, different from the subsidy-based system, which is simply unavailable. We need a different model, which is based on, cust on custom mass customization, and for that, somebody has to be willing to invest in developing these systems so that we can actually start doing something that is relevant, meaningful, timely, affordable, and that will not depend on endless flow of funds and endless discussions who will pay in the rich countries for low-income countries because this is a dying paradigm. I'm Fola Laoye, Chairman of Hygieia, um, which is a, an integrated health group in Nigeria, working with the Health Insurance Fund to deliver uh, health insurance to low-income groups in the country. Hygieia was formed almost 30 years ago by my parents, who were both physicians, who also had had uh, their careers in the public sector and in public health. Uh, then, after they retired, went into the private sector, but still very much having the motivation and the commitment to helping to to deliver public health services. We are able, at least in, in the work we're doing and with the partners that we have, to, to look at the very difficult uh, issues of, pub of delivering public health services, um, but from a private perspective, which is quite uh, unique and quite innovative. Um, but in so doing, helping to bridge the gap between uh, affordability uh, those what people can afford and what is the cost of health care. I think for me, uh, one growing up around the business and also where, the, where we got to, I did realize that there was a, a model to be sustained, you know, that could be built and could be sustained and could be taken to scale. Uh, and, I, and I often think that in the private sector, you know, we are able to sometimes be a bit more nimble and a bit more um, proactive in terms of looking at innovative ways um, to solve problems. Nigeria is a country that has large population and very poor health indicators, so that in itself is a problem. Um, but going beyond that, also trying to build a health system uh, for a country that's very disparate, that has many different cultures, very, you know, geographically disparate, is quite difficult. But particularly made more difficult because of challenges of infrastructure, of human resources, you know, of real capacity. Uh, and that's something that you know, health you know, uh, needs to really be, be successful and viable. We do want to see stronger political will. Uh, one, with a government putting a better financing structure for healthcare on the table. We are still severely underfinanced um, as a sector. Um, but even apart from the financing, the regulatory side of it still needs a lot of work, needs a lot of commitment, needs a lot of capacity. And, um, you know, and especially if the private sector is going to play a bigger role, it's very important, again, that there's a regulatory framework that governs what the private sector is doing. So yes, it's an area that, you know, is still uh, nascent. And uh, I, for one, I'm very hopeful that this current government will do a lot more. One important area is what is the cost of healthcare. Um, so yeah, it may sound more quantitative than qualitative, but it, in a way it's linked um, because that also really gets us to understand what is the what are the disease prevalences we're dealing with now. We all have heard and seen the numbers globally and even Pan-African for um, the incidence of non-communicable diseases and what that impact is on health systems. But I don't think we have done enough work and gathered enough data in Nigeria 
to be able to really holistically say, you know, this is what it's going to cost and, and how do we tackle that. The work we've been doing with the Health Insurance Fund has actually almost brought that even more um, to the fore than we had, we had thought it would. I'm Gina Holtz and I'm the project manager with the ILO's Microinsurance Innovation Facility based in Geneva. I've been at the ILO since 2008. That's when the Microinsurance Innovation Facility was started. So we began um, after we received a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And prior to that, I was in the private sector. Um, I have a health insurance background. The transition from private sector to the ILO has been an interesting one for me. Um, actually, I'm able to use a lot of the skills and experience that I gained working in health insurance for as many years as I did. But the difference now is that I'm applying them for low-income clients. Uh, as opposed to higher income clients. I did have aspirations to give back more um, as a result of the good fortune that I've had myself. Um, and it's been very fulfilling for me to go to ILO and work at the Microinsurance Innovation Facility. Um, I think that it's also rewarding in, in the sense that I'm able to apply the skills that um, maybe are in high demand and are less prevalent in developing economies and in the microinsurance sector, and that is you know, commercial insurance and business skills. So that's been very useful. This, this topic of capacity building is something that we're talking about more and more. And what, what we've seen from the work that we've done in working through others and funding a number, more than 50 different projects across developing countries, is that there's already a lot of knowledge out there. And yes, there is a, still a need to transfer knowledge um, from some places to others, but nonetheless, knowledge is there, yet people keep continuing to make the same mistakes. So capacity building is essential, and it's really putting knowledge into practice. And this is something that we, we work in now, and we see the need to work more in the future um, within capacity building. We're practitioner focused, so I think that, I mean, the needs are broad and diverse, there's no question, but f basic fundamentals in terms of designing insurance products, um, knowing how to distribute them, how to price them, really all aspects of the insurance value chain, um, we can see a demand for capacity building. Um, on the back end, claims adjudication and client servicing, all of these things. One of the things that I'm most proud of that we are doing and, and the way we are positioning ourselves is to be a hub for knowledge. So our aspiration is that we can aggregate knowledge and play a critical role in disseminating that. So as I said before, knowledge is out there, but it's somehow not getting transferred to the right people at the right time. Um, so that's the role that we are playing and um, intend to continue to play. We have, this is also I think a, a direction that we see a greater need um, for ILO to play. ILO, as you mentioned, is, is an active participate, participant with policymakers. But when it comes to microinsurance, and because insurance is really at the crossroads between um, universal health coverage and private sector initiatives, and I think this whole facet of public-private partnerships is one area that we see ourselves being a neutral um, and prominent figure and, and that we can play a role in bringing together these diverse parties. My name is Kwesi Bwahine. I work with Health Insurance Fund and Health Insurance Fund is an organization in Amsterdam which promotes private community-based health insurance schemes in Africa for low-income people. If you talk about uh, the programs we have in Nigeria, we're talking about people who earn less than one dollar a day. So, you know, they are very poor. Mm -hmm. For those communities, they got to receive subsidies. 
you know, for the premium that they pay. And then you have groups which are not so rich, but because they earn a steady stream of income, they can pay a considerable part of the premium. What we're trying to do is we pull in uh, resources and risk. And I think it's, it's, it's the future for healthcare in Africa, eh? because if you consider the fact that Africa is home to only 10% of the world population, but has about 67% of AIDS cases, eh? maternal uh, death, women who die at pregnancy and childbirth, Africa has about 50% of those deaths. So when you look at those gloomy uh, statistics, then there's no way that you know, we could just let it be as it is, but come up with strategies which can support us fund uh, healthcare. Now, one thing we have to um, bear in mind is, you know, uh, if you're talking about a long-term uh, health insurance scheme, certainly you've got to focus on different groups of people. Yeah? So you have cross-subsidization, uh, you know, the rich subsidizing the poor, and uh, the healthy subsidizing the sick. Yeah? So that's the basic principle. But you come to, you, you go to certain uh, communities where people are just poor. You know, we have a program in Kwara, uh, in the center of Nigeria. People cannot afford to pay more than 10% of, 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 the, of the premium. There you got to find, you know, you got to uh, set up innovative uh, financing schemes. So what we have there is that the people, they pay 10% of the premium. The state government has agreed to pay a considerable part of, of the premium subsidy. You know, so you have the state channeling its resources through us because of the track record which we have there. And certainly, you know, uh, with the support of uh, the donors, we could also do our best, you know, to help uh, subsidize part of, the, uh, part of the premium. You can make the case, uh, the investment case, and that is, that is good, eh? investment case meaning that you are pooling resources, you know, at local level, whether from the people themselves, from the government, uh, from private sector, you are pooling resources to finance healthcare. That is the investment case. What, for me, as an African, what I find stimulating is that this is a moment where we are engaging poor people who have never participated actively in their own development in terms of paying part of the cost. Yeah, so that idea of stimulating self-reliance among poor African people is something that excites me. There are many challenges, but if for the sake of time, if I have to name three, I will first look at the population. You know, we go to a population community which has no understanding or limited understanding of health insurance. Yeah, so they tell you, I will participate in it, but if I don't fall ill, I will come for my money. Yeah? So uh, insurance literacy, you know, trying to educate people to understand that this is insurance, and it's insurance for you when you fall ill, that you can use it. When you don't fall ill, it's still important to participate. You know, that is really a challenge. The second challenge I see is more at the policy level. You know, African governments are very good at coming out with very stringent regulations, you know, which definitely stifle the insurance industry. And I think it's important that we engage them also at the policy level to make them understand the need to have flexible policies which will uh, stimulate the insurance market. And the last one, but not the least, is the administration of insurance. You know, you go to a community, the local uh, healthcare provider is used to receiving money and providing care and then you go with your capitation, you know, which he doesn't understand. You have set up an administration system, you know, to overcome fraud, managing that, and even identifying where people live, you know, it's, it's very challenging. And I, can, I, I know that in Kwara, we even went to the extent of numbering houses mm -hmm. just to have a firm understanding of where people live. The policymakers should stimulate good governance, and that means ensuring, first of all, that they use their resources efficiently. And they also have processes, you know, which will stimulate participation of private sector in the insurance industry in the countries. <music>
My name is Dogo Muhammad. I am the immediate uh, past uh, chief executive for the National Insurance Scheme, Nigeria. Uh, professionally, I am a trained uh, urological surgeon, uh, and I still practice. Uh, I have a practice in Abuja. It was almost at the verge of collapse in 2006. So at uh, that time, I was with the Minister of Health and I was in the division of inspectorate we are responsible for checking quality uh, for the tertiary hospitals in Nigeria, uh, both public and uh, uh, private, the teaching hospitals and all the tertiary hospitals. So uh, I was sent there for two months to see if I can make you know, any miracle to, to sort of resuscitate. So two months translated to six months and thereafter I was even appointed as a substantive uh, executive secretary, so I hung on for another five years. Uh, so during that period, I saw the organization actually pulling out from its problems and then stabilized, and then, you know, tried to answer some of the expectations of the population. And then we are stuck in there because Nigeria has three tiers of government. And uh, anything with the different governments that are autonomous, you find that if you have a national program, what obtains at federal level doesn't mean it, it will be easily accepted at state level because they are autonomous. So we have 36 states. Then it has to cascade also to the local governments. We have 774. So what started at federal level, initially people were skeptical that it will not work. Then it worked. Then people started asking, when will it touch my life? So we are forced to go ahead from the formal sector to the informal sector. So and that's where actually I focus most of my you know, attention trying to develop the products that will address the various segments of our society. Mm. And uh, in Nigeria, the formal sector constitutes about 80%. And these are people who could be gainfully employed or not employed at all. And uh, they carry the, the heaviest burden of disease. Uh, they are socioeconomically excluded. They have high index of you know, diseases. And also the literacy level at that level is a bit low. And where they are residing also is in the periphery, not in the urbanized area. So 90% of the disease burden are there. The infrastructure is not there. And most of the people who should be giving them attention, the doctors, the nurses, the pharmacists, live in the urban areas. So you get a lopsided distribution of facilities and the human resource for health. And then the country is saying that we want to change our health indices. We, we have to crash them. There is no way you can crash them so long you are maintaining your presence in the urban areas. You have to, you know, move to the periphery. So there must be a demand creation approach that will attract these young medical professionals to move to the periphery so that, uh, you know, people can get care. So that was a big challenge. It's not a problem of just human resource. There could be enough human resource for health, but the maldistribution. It's not about the physical, you know, presence of hospitals and clinics, etc., but the distribution again all lopsided in favor of the urban areas. So when people saw NHS was working, they brought all the problems of health and lumped it on this tiny organization that was grappling to maintain, you know, some kind of presence and make, it, make a name, you know, for, for itself to see that, yes, we can do it. And uh, we had a team that we believe we've got to get it right. We, we, we believe that, yes, we have attained the critical mass in terms of commitment, numeracy, to take the agenda to the next level. So that's what we kept on doing. We developed the community-based social insurance scheme for Nigeria with three different models, implementation manuals. And then we went and did an inventory of existing mutuals, existing microfinance groups, burial societies, cooperative groups, etc., to serve as entry points all over the country. And then we set criteria and did some selection. Up initial, we wanted to select only 50 pilot sites in the country so that we can test for the next three years. We are privileged to compare notes with the other countries. We went to India, uh, RSBY. We met also with the Micro uh, Insurance Academy. It was Dr. Daror, you know, trying to, to see, you know, to learn. We went to Rwanda and saw what they were doing. We went to Uganda. We went to Mexico. Still the cigar. We went to Brazil. You know, we all try to, you know, collect experiences so that we can fast track this process. 
And uh, the president launched community health insurance in Nigeria 17th December 2011. And along with it also, we address the demand side because other Nigerians who have the financial muscle to flex are saying that we would like to have the same benefit package as those in the formal sector. So we introduced voluntary contributor program, same benefit package, and uh, was IT solution for registration. You buy your voucher, scratch it, go online, register, get your electronic receipt, go to your hospital or the HMO, will take the biometrics, you have paid the premium, and you are up and running. The, the financing of this, whenever you introduce a new you know, product, there is a paradigm shift in financing health. And then you expect these people who you say are socially excluded to contribute. So that challenged us. And we're looking at other innovative ways. How can we mobilize resources? Nigeria has been grappling with our uh, national health bill you know, to get it approved. It went through the parliament, came up for presidential assent, but because of some reasons, it was not signed into law, it expired. Okay, in that, if it had been approved, 2% of the federal consolidated revenue would have gone to primary health care. There were some professional, you know, rivalry among the medical team. Some were complaining in terms of the leadership of the agency, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, there is a tertiary hospitals uh, commission to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of established and is part of the health bill. And then they are saying that it doesn't have to be a doctor, but then the document is talking that it should be a doctor. So that actually, and then other cries here and there. So, of course, a political environment, they have to listen to everybody. And that actually delayed. Then it overlapped. The new, you know, uh, parliament comes into place, then it has to go back. Mm -hmm. But if it has gone through, 50% of that 2% will be sent to the National Health Insurance to give cover. Mm -hmm. So when we didn't get that one, meanwhile we are thinking, and that's why uh, we talk about this one couple per second thing, mm -hmm. and we thought it is a very brilliant way of mobilizing resources. When you take the oil, Nigeria is a, a one product uh, economy. Everything oil, oil, oil. But uh, some 20 years, oil was not significant in Nigeria. It was more of agriculture and other you know, mineral resources. But today, about 90% of our revenue is from oil. And we have overloaded oil. So I think another thing is we have to allow people to take responsibility. You know, it's not always for just government give. But what do you give to your country? So when you, when, when you are looking at this thing, once you say it's about oil, oil is not forever. It will get exhausted. So there, definitely there is a need. There is a need. We look at other ways of financing health. And we thought this one is a brilliant way of financing it because it will continue to increase. And I've seen it increasing from the time we had the idea, 80 million lines, to now 110 million lines, and they will continue to increase. So really we have to look at the ways we can finance different different, uh, you know, facilities or services to our people. And this is one of them. And I think it's user-friendly. Many people who are talking, buying, scratching, upfront and talking, they don't even care how much. They wouldn't know you are paying a couple per second, which is contributing to health. And uh, I know health, another thing which I want to say maybe a little bit outside what you have asked me is, we have overflogged the issue of financing health, financing health, financing health. And when you look at it, it is all about curative. But there are other collaborations, you know, outside health that could make a difference. Take water. 60% of communicable diseases are waterborne. Give people good drinking water, that thing will crash. When you talk about the environment, the drainages are blocked. Stagnant water, that's a breeding place for mosquitoes. That's a vector for malaria. 50% of our disease burden is malaria. Clear that. Let the water move. Let us destroy all the breeding places. Malaria will crash. You understand? So these are some of the things that we have to see collaboration. Ministry of Health, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Finance, you know, like that. Ministry of Water, Resources and Sanitation. So that we reduce the burden of disease through preventive methods and other infrastructural solutions. And then good living, health talks, etc. Preventive things immunization, etc. With that, all the disease burden will crash to the barest minimum. 
then whatever little money we have, we can be able to treat the diseases. So this is what I think we should be looking instead of overflogging. And when you talk about curative, curative, then you have those people who are in the primary health center or in the primary environment talking of the tertiary is too expensive. You know, you put so many, but you allow people to get sick. You can prevent them from getting sick. My name is Maria Elena Bidino. I work for the National Insurance Confederation in Brazil. We deal with all kinds of insurance, and my role there is consumer protection, microinsurance, international affairs are the main subjects. Countries like Brazil, we have a very huge amount of population that is um, lower class and insurance is a tool that can protect them for vulnerability and health insurance is the main product that anybody uh, from different classes but mainly for the poor people they look for and in Brazil we have public health insurance uh, protection but the government cannot ha give them the quality and the speed of, of, of the services they need. So we also have the private insurance and plans and insurance company uh, providers. We have both for both systems. The public, everybody is covered. Mm -hmm. the, the private sector, sector uh, covers more than 60 million people nowadays. But it's, it's getting very expensive. So individual plan insurance is very difficult to find because it's getting too expensive. The government interferes in the price also. So uh, nobody is happy. The population is not happy. The hospital, the doctors are not happy because they receive a very small amount. So you go to a doctor, they, they even can look at your face because they don't have time. So sometimes it's better the government treatment, uh, although it takes time to receive it, but you have doctors that are there for this purpose. So it's, a, it's very challenging. There is a lot of uh, regulation, very heavy regulation, and we are afraid, as your deputy minister an, uh, announced here, that uh, too much regulation also can dismantle the small providers, and that is what can happen in Brazil. Regulation is the most challenging, and uh, they should have more dialogue. Pri the government with the, the private sector, we are in the same boat, and they should, uh, even the private sector should listen the the challenge of the government and and the other side too should be more dialogue they want to protect so much the consumer they are feeding the market with so many regulations and so many law that is have is a, is a costly uh, consumers because at the end of the day the consumer pay pay, pay the bill I'm uh, Segi Pele. I'm from South Africa. I'm the chief executive of the National Health Laboratory Services. My own country, there's a big discussion and debate right now around the introduction of a national health insurance scheme. So we just got the green paper out. The Minister of Health has just put out a green paper. And all of us, including my own organization, are now beginning to take the first steps towards the implementation of no, some form of health insurance. The key issue is that uh, the question of providing uh, um, comprehensive health care for the citizens of particularly developing countries is, is possible if people apply their minds in a, in a very strategic way. And I've seen, I've seen many examples today of, what, of how uh, small groups of people in partnership with governments and involving the citizens 
and uh, beneficiaries of the program have been able to set up small and hopefully slowly can can scale that up so just just in terms of the kind of key the key lessons here was uh, the one is that it's becoming increasingly obvious that uh, governments alone can't provide for the health care of all its citizens. There's a big question around an economic environment that makes it very difficult, but also with the competing uh, needs of a country, choices have to be made. And I think one of the options that are available to us is that every citizen uh, from a hu human rights perspective and, from, and certainly from my country, from a constitutional pers perspective, has a right to health care. But I think that there are models in which the citizens and government can work together to provide the financing base to deliver the kind of quality health care that, that people deserve. Many countries are trying to achieve the same thing. So the destination, the final destination is going to be the same, whether we're in South Africa, whether we're in Nigeria, whether we're in Ghana, whether we're in the Philippines. But obviously there are different routes that we can take to achieve this uh, universal coverage. And there are important lessons for us to learn, both from industrialized countries like uh, the Netherlands right now, uh, there's uh, huge successes, but there are also some weaknesses. I'm hoping that uh, we can leapfrog stages of development. I hope that we'll not be, we don't have to walk every stage that uh, the, the Netherlands, for example, went through. So I think from where we are sitting at the moment, there, there are opportunities for us to achieve much sooner what many of the industrialized and, and uh, developed countries have taken a much longer time for, uh, for, to, for for us to achieve what we wanted to set out to do. So from, uh, from that perspective, um, I think that there are, there's no right model for any country. I, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from the presentations today. But the, the key issue is that whether you're starting off big, whether you're starting off from the top, or whether you're starting off from the bottom, uh, really doesn't matter. I think it really depends on what is the economic base of the country and what is the skills base and what are the systems that we have. So while my own country may be choosing national health uh, uh, insurance scheme, and it basically is top down, but we've seen the examples in Nigeria, we've seen the examples in Ghana, we've seen the examples in the Philippines, uh, for instance, where around small communities, you slowly built up the base. But the important lesson from all of this Whatever small community-based alternative is set up or insurance scheme is set up, in the end, it must all be integrated in some kind of national uh, universal coverage for all of the citizens of, of, of the country. The, the key issue is that there's a lot of, there are a lot of innovation within communities. And uh, even in poor communities, what we're learning is that people have resources. They may not have huge amount of resources, but they have some resources. And I think that if, if there are creative ways in which those resources can be pooled, then I think the lesson for policymakers is don't automatically assume that people don't have anything. Pool, whether it's the one dollar or the 50 cents, but once you pull that, suddenly the, the problem doesn't seem as big anymore. But if you're looking at an individual and trying to respond to the individual, then it seems like it's insurmountable. So I think that's the, the, the first aspect. The second aspect about uh, policymakers is allow these small pilot projects to evolve. Because out of these pilot projects, you learn both successes, but you also learn what you shouldn't do again. So I think, I think that's the second side. And the third side is that uh, you know it's important that governments all over in developing countries begin to create the legislative framework for all of this to happen. Because you also don't want a national uh, health insurance scheme. People contribute to that, but they actually don't get the benefit. And the benefit is really about providing uh, affordable health care to the citizens. The objective of universal health insurance is not about collecting money. It's about ensuring that we can finance the health care that citizens are not getting right now. I'm Sanjay Datta. I'm the Chief of Underwriting and Claims in ICICI Lombard, the biggest, largest uh, health insurance company in India. We've uh, developed a uh, uh, lot. We're a billion dollar company now. We've grown in various uh, aspects of general insurance. But the biggest uh, uh, product with a lot of potential is health insurance. The market is growing very fast. Till last year, it was growing at 35% CAGR. 
and uh, we, we work in you know all the three segments, which is the retail, corporate, as well as the uh, you know the insurance for the rural poor. We are one of the biggest uh, insurance partners with the government for their financial inclusion programs. So there are two, three schemes which we run with the government. One is national insurance scheme for uh, the poor, which is a uh, smart card based scheme which we run for the government. We believe, uh, uh, you know, access to, to quality health care at affordable, uh, you know, prices is a fundamental right. You know, as, as fundamental as human rights, actually. And, uh, you know, to, to play that part, I think, you, you know, insurance has to play a big part in providing that access through finance, uh, financial mechanisms which work for such an access. And, uh, you know, India is a billion uh, a people, of, you know, billion people, and most of them are very poor. And it's important for us to make sure that our processes and the uh, kind of insurance products we develop for them are we work on efficiency, which is uh, technology based where the costs are very low, the product is, you know uh, you know has a high utilization rate and is sustainable in the long run. So that's what we've been working for. And of course, scale is an important part. And while we you know, understand scale, we also need, we feel that there's a need to customize products according to the various regions of India, because India is a, a union of you know, about 28 states. In India, about 60% you know, of healthcare costs uh, are met out of pocket for I mean, outpatient treatment. Uh, most of the health insurance products are for inpatient treatment. For a certain, you know, uh, group of uh, under, you know, uh, privileged people who work as artisans and weavers, we developed a scheme where the lead product is an outpatient uh, product, where the utilization rate, you know, went up significantly once we adopted technology-based processes with no paperwork. And the scheme has started working very well. The enrollment rates have gone up. The retention rates have gone up. And it's all hinged around, you know, outpatient sort of clinics which work near the doorstep of the, uh, you know, community. So we've, we've innovated a lot in health insurance. Not only have we innovated in terms of processes, but also products. So we've brought in a lot of products, uh, which are uh, you know uh, you know at first in terms of you know you know in all the segments of the you know the population. So we've you know brought in concepts like you know floater summer shirt for the families. We brought in concepts like you know having outpatient treatment included as part of um, you know, the inpatient coverages. And of course, we worked a lot on you know other products which are you know you know uh, you know like critical illness coverages which are linked to bank home loan products, mm -hmm. which uh, normally have a lot of loss of income sort of elements to it. Mm -hmm. So you know we devised a lot of uh, you know uh, critical illness products or you know hospital daily cash products. I believe uh, you know uh, that. Uh, you know, insurers have to play a big part in you know financial inclusion, given the fact that India is a very very uh, undersaturated market, and we can leapfrog, uh, you know, through the learnings of all the other com you know countries in terms of what they attempted and what were the good practices, uh, you know, uh, you know, which we can bring you know forth for our con you know country and maybe for the population which we serve, uh, you know, so you know uh, access to kind of these kind of conferences also helps uh, a lot to pick up ideas, good ideas across the world which we should be able to bring across to uh, you know, good quality access to healthcare through the insurance system. Big idea, of course, is the fact that uh, you know, you know, one needs to collaborate uh, a lot. Healthcare is a you know, complex uh, you know, system where, where every part of the social system is involved, including health policy makers. Uh, the academics, uh, you know, uh, and various other, you know, sort of bodies. In fact, uh, I was just mentioning uh, to the director of ISS that you know a lot of the policymakers or people in academia are like navigators to us while we drive the car. So you know, you know, they help us a lot in you know driving in the right direction because there's a lot of the thing is unknown. You know, we are charting new territories, and that's where we need a lot of navigators to help us to drive correctly. I think uh, they have to f focus on the fundamental part, which is health risks. You know, uh, health risks are as important as, as I said, fundamental rights. There needs to be, be mechanisms where uh, health risks are properly pooled, with the, at least the ones which are not cannot be borne by the individual in the long run. And the second and the most important part is, you know, while we call it insurance, at the end of the day, it should seem like assurance. They need to, you know, keep healthy, 
you remain healthy in case something happens, there is someone to take care of things. Thank you.